Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I love Amsterdam. I know um, we're all probably looking forward to dinner, um, so I will, uh, I will try to be brief. Um, but also, there is going to be code on the, um, on the screen, so if you want to move um, forward, that's what I would recommend. But also, if you, don't, um, if you aren't able to see anything, just come find me after, um, and I have some examples that I can, that I can give to you. Okay, so in a previous job than the one that I have now, I was working as a data scientist at a nonprofit that built software for caseworkers in child welfare. And we were looking at the data and we noticed that we had some children in the data that were older than their parents. And not only were they older than their parents, they were like a lot older than their parents and they were like a lot older than everyone. Um, <laughs> and. Once we started looking at, you know, the, the, the distribution of ages and we started looking at the birth dates, it was pretty easy to figure out what had happened. So there was a bug in the software that my company was building such that if you entered the birth year information as two digits instead of four, um, we would only store those two digits and we wouldn't prepend the century information on. So if a caseworker is entering information about a child um, born in the year 2008 um, and they enter it as 08, uh, we would claim that that child was born in the year 8 AD. So everyone, everyone that works with data has stories like this. Um, we have assumptions about the data, but our assumptions don't hold. And so what were my assumptions in this, in this story? Um, the first is that children are born after their parents. Um, and the second is that there's an upper limit to how old a person can live. And I had sort of like a, a kind of vague upper limit for myself. Um, but when I was writing this talk, I was actually curious about like, what's the longest someone has ever lived? And it turns out that the longest confirmed human lifespan is over 122 years. Um, this person is no longer living. Um, but if you, uh, if you look at the Wikipedia page for like longest confirmed lifespans of the top 10, one of them is still alive. So what are some other assumptions that we generally have about data? Um, uh, one of the big ones is that um, all of the data are there. There's no missing data. Um, another might be that the records are unique. There aren't, there aren't any duplicates. Um, one that was definitely important to us um, when I was working with um, the software company was, um, is there any personally identifiable information, things like social security numbers? Um, and this is like obviously not an exhaustive list. Um, and so this, this sort of poses a really important question, which is um, how do we make sure that our assumptions are valid, right? So how, is it fair for me to assume that children should have birth dates after their parents. And the second one is, how do I make sure that my assumptions are being met? And the reason that we need to answer these two questions is because we don't just collect data to have it, right? Like, we, we have data around in order to make decisions, um, to change processes, to pick different workflows. Um, so in this example, Age is a really important attribute when caseworkers are making decisions about what options they have for a child. Um, and so another thing, and I was talking to Yanis about this last night, and this was not originally in my talk, but um, we had such a good conversation about it that I wanted to bring it up as well, is that um, we all know that, that data collection is, is very, very brittle. Right? So you can introduce a change into a data set and it'll just like your entire ETL pipeline is just going to come like crashing down around your ears and you're going to have to rewrite the whole thing to work with the new data and you're going to do this all the time. And so those kinds of, those kinds of data failures when the data um, sort of don't meet your assumptions, they're kind, of, they're kind of nice in a way because they're loud and you can find them and they break stuff so they don't make it all the way through into your application or they don't um, I, I now work for Two Sigma Investments. They don't make it all the way through into a live trading model. Um, but there are also all kinds of assumptions we have about data that if those aren't being met, they sort of sneak right by. They don't break things. Um, good examples of these are, you know, what if the failure that you have is that the data set didn't even show up, so it didn't even kick off a process that could have then fallen over. 
And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, how can we extend uh, the software methodology of unit testing to data to try to make our assumptions about data explicit, um, to get in the habit as people that work with data of validating our assumptions, and to give us confidence that our assumptions are being met. So I'm Jane. Uh, I work at Two Sigma Investments in New York, and I like really don't want to be the person that gets up in front of a group of people and like recites my company's mission statement. Um, but my company's mission statement <laughs> <laughs> is to find value in the world's data. And so in order to do this, um, one, we have to bring in all of the world's data. Um, we're very good at that. Um, and we need to make sure that all of our assumptions about that data, um, we need to make sure that those assumptions are rock solid, that they're motivated, and we need to make sure that they're being met. And we need to do this for thousands of data sets and thousands of diverse data sets. So um, what does this look like just for one data set? So usually we start by like reading the documentation, if there is any, um, and we start by exploring and analyzing the data. And, and we're, you know, either explicitly or implicitly, we're developing a set of assumptions about how these data um, should behave. And this is expensive. Um, it takes time, and it also takes domain expertise. So um, in, a, in a talk earlier, we were looking at um, MRI images. I have very, very little experience with, um, with image data personally. So it's going to be difficult for, uh, you know, without that domain expertise for me to come up with a set of well-motivated um, assumptions about that kind of data. So we might need to hire someone else that's better at that than me. Um, and also while we're doing this, while we're sort of exploring and analyzing the data, um, while we're sort of looking at the schema and then looking at the data and looking at the metadata and then looking at the data and saying, okay, you know, was it fair for me to assume that children should have birth dates after their parents? And often the documentation is really shoddy, so th there are many conversations with your data vendor about, okay, like, well, what is, like, what's actually in here? And then when you're all done, um, you should write all that stuff down. And so now you get a gold star, right? You've been, you've been explicit about your assumptions, you've validated that they hold for your data set, and seriously, you wrote it down. Like, seriously, write this stuff down. Um, but what if the data change? So data are always changing. Um, one, really classic one really classic way that data change is just that you get more. Um, so it's like the next month's worth of data um, from this data vendor. But you also have to deal with things like um, collection uh, technologies or processes being upgraded. You, you deal with um, questions being added to and removed from surveys. And you also deal with things like um, panels like grow and change over time. And so how do you know that your assumptions are still valid? And like, how do you know that they're still being met? So like, if you didn't write down your assumption, like, that's on you. Like your own, you're your own worst enemy. But if you did write your assumptions down, that's great because you can go back to that list and you can say, okay, this is what I, you know, this is what I decided on at first. I'm going to look at my new data set and I'm going to say, okay, do all of these things still hold? But this really doesn't scale. So one problem could be that like the data are just too big or they arrive too frequently for you to sort of do this like, okay, here are my assumptions, I'm going to check the data. Here are my assumptions, I'm going to check the data. Um, but another problem is that what if you're responsible for managing more than that, just like that one data set, but you have tens, hundreds, even thousands of data sets that you're actually personally responsible for stewarding. And like, what if you go on vacation or switch teams? Or in a more severe example that we were talking about last night, like what if you're hospitalized and you really can't be reached and someone has to deal with um, the data that are coming in? So what we really, what we really want, um, we want, we want something that's sort of like set it and forget it. We want somewhere to write our assumptions down. We want that place to evaluate our assumptions for us. And we want it to tell us when those assumptions aren't being met. And so, we sort of realized this problem, um, and 
I was sort of like, you know, like, hey, like, unit test is a really good um, existing framework that solves a lot of these, these problems that I have. Um, and it has a couple of advantages. Um, uh, and I can talk more about why we picked unit test specifically. Um, all of the examples in this talk, by the way, are going to be um, Python unit test. Um, there are other testing libraries in Python. And if you want to talk about why we picked unit test over PyTest, for example, um, just come find me after and we can have a lively debate. Um, anyway, so, so some of the things. Also, I apologize for the browser bar at the top. We could just not figure out how to get that to go away. Um, uh, anyway, so so one of so some some things we liked about um, unit test is it's it's flexible, so it allows us to implement a bunch of different testing strategies. So one of the things that's similar between um, uh, data and like a data set and a code base is that in the same way that you can't test two code bases in the same way, um, you'll have a really hard time effectively testing two data sets in the same way. And I like to joke, you know, like if we could. <laughs> Test these data sets the same way. Why are we paying for them both? Um, the other, the thing that we really liked is that it's it's kind of it's batteries included. So there's a test runner. Um, it will automatically sort of catch failures and errors for me, and it will aggregate them into a digest that that I can read. Right. So it was important to us not to um, roll our own. We wanted to use the tools that were all already developed, already supported. Um, and lastly. Uh, Unit testing is, um, it's a repeatable and it's an automatable process. So um, one of the problems if we were sort of manually um, reasserting our assumptions on the data set is that, you know, that's, um, it's inconsistent um, and, it's, and it's error prone. So what does it actually look like uh, when we try to write a unit test um, for data? So Again, if you're in the back, I really apologize if you can't see this. Um, I will walk through. Um, I will walk through every piece of this. Um, so, the first. How many of you are you familiar with unit test? Amazing. So, this should look very familiar to you. Um, I'm going to talk through it uh, pretty explicitly for the people that aren't familiar. Um, so, the first part. So, this is a this is a test case class. Um, and these first two methods are just my test, my setup, and my teardown. And uh, I made some fake data to purposefully make these fail. Um, but in the setup, I'm basically loading my data. I can be loading it from everywhere. It could be up from anywhere. I could be reading it from HTFS. It could be a SQL query. I could be hitting an HTTP endpoint. And then in the teardown, I'm like taking the data off my test case so that every single test method gets a fresh copy, which is really important. You don't want to, your test methods to pollute each other in any way. Um, and so I wrote two um, test methods for the two assumptions that I named earlier. The first is that um, children are, their birth dates are after their parents' birth dates. And so um, DF here is a pandas data frame. Um, that, this might be a confusing expression to people that aren't familiar with pandas. But basically what I'm saying is I'm, I'm making like a Boolean mask that says, okay, um, for every row in my data frame, does, is the child's birth date after the parent's birth date? And then I'm making sure that, that like every sort of element in that series is true. We're good. And this second test here, which I <laughs> had a very difficult time coming up with a name for, and I was very proud of what I came up with. Um, does everyone know who Methuselah is? No? Okay. Methuselah lived for like 900 years or something like that. He's like a, he's a biblical figure. So what I did in this test is I take that, um, that longest confirmed lifespan, uh, 122 years and 163 days. And I said, okay, if you lived that long, if you were that old today, when would you have to be born? And then I compare all of the parents' birth date, or I compare the minimum parent birth date and the minimum child birth date to... Um, uh, that like earliest possible birth date. And so if we run this, um, we'll get failure messages like these. Um, and again, I, I, made them, I made them fail on purpose. And so this is useful because I've, I've written my, my two assumptions down. And now I can run this test case every time I get new data. And if weird birth dates are ever delivered, um, my tests are going to fail and I'll know that something is wrong. And so 
this seems great, um, but when you try to do this, like a couple of interesting um, challenges and interesting differences um, crop up. And so the first is that uh, unit testing as an approach assumes that there's a clear-cut pass-fail that you can evaluate. And our assumptions about data just aren't always a clear-cut pass-fail. And the second is that um, you know, software unit tests usually fail um, as you are literally making changes to the code. And that's not usually the scenario in which um, data unit tests fail. And finally, getting a data unit test passing isn't only about like fixing the data. There's, there's more that's involved. So to dig into these uh, challenges a little bit. Um, so for example, uh, for, children that are for children that are older than their parents, I might say, okay, yeah, that's always a failure. That's like a pretty unambiguous, like, that should never happen. But for people that are really old, um, it's a bit different. Like, I might care about the difference between being, you know, one day older than the longest confirmed lifespan versus um, 100 years longer than the oldest confirmed lifespan. Or I also might care about, like, um, the distribution of ages, or I might care, okay, how many bad birth dates do I have? And the second challenge is that tests usually don't fail because of changes that you made, right? So again, software unit tests usually fail as a result of a change you just made to the code. Um, and there's, so what that means is that there's a good chance that you have context on what caused the failure. But Data unit tests often fail as the result of changes made upstream. And these can be um, perhaps even outside of your organization. So they can be changes that the data vendor made and are completely opaque to you. And that means that you might have zero context on what caused the failure. And finally, getting a data unit test passing isn't just about fixing the data. Um, so another, um, another sort of assumption that we have about data that I mentioned earlier is that there um, is no PII in the data set. So this is a little test method um, with the uh, over-the-top social security number regex match pattern from this great article. Um, uh, it really does not fit onto one line. Um, uh, <laughs> it, um, this over-the-top one um, not only excludes social security numbers that are actually like malformed, but it also takes out like common sort of dupes or fakes. Um, and so then I say, okay, for every, um, for every column in my data frame and for every cell in that column, I just wanna make sure that there's not a social security number regex match. And so again, I made this test fail. I'm gonna get a failure like we see here. Um, and I could get my test, I could get my data unit test passing again by removing the social security numbers from the data set, but that's not necessarily the right thing to do. The right thing to do might be to call the data vendor and be like, what the heck? Like, you can't be sending us social security numbers. Or it might be to go talk to the developers or data engineers and say like, hey, like, we really need to be um, hashing or encrypting these social security numbers. And you know, how are you supposed to know that you're supposed to do either of those things? And so what these three sort of challenges have in common is that the problem is that context is really expensive to recover. And this context includes, you know, why is this test here? Um, what caused this failure? And like, really, what am I supposed to do about it? So to go, to go back to our Methuselah's example, you know, we can see that 1894.12.5 is not greater than or equal to 1895.12.5, but like, what are these dates? And like, why do we expect one to be greater than the other? And like, what am I supposed to do about it? Um, and this is especially hard if, you know, like, if I wrote this test yesterday, I'll probably be able to recover all of that context. But what if this, this test hasn't failed in two years? Or what if I've never seen this test before because I'm new to this team? Or what if I have 10 other failures like this that need to be handled in like special ways? And so the information I need to answer these questions isn't really anywhere in this failure message. And so the question that we had for ourselves was, can we somehow use test failures to help us recover context when they fail? And this is why we built 
marbles. And before I go any further, I promise you it is free and open source. So everything I'm about to talk about, um, you can start playing with it right now if you insist, but I think you should keep listening. Um, so Marbles is a, again, it's a, it's a Python unit test extension that gives you really rich um, human readable failure messages. So I'm gonna, it's, they're, they're bigger than traditional um, unit test failure messages, so I'm gonna walk through this step by step. So the first thing to notice um, is that there's no, um, we get the same like actual assertion error as you see in a normal unit test failure message, but we've removed the traceback. And the reason that we did that is that a marbles failure message, as you'll see, it's gonna contain all of the information you would normally find in a traceback, but it presents it in a more consumable way. So we can take that traceback out without losing any information. Um, if you miss the traceback, <laughs> if you love the traceback and wanna see the traceback, um, it is possible to run your tests in verbose mode and you'll get that traceback back. Um, the second part, and this is very, this is similar to PyTest, is that um, we'll pull out the line of code and the surrounding lines of code for the actual assertion statement inside of your unit test that failed. And so this is helpful because um, in a Python traceback, it only gives you the last line of um, the assertion that failed. So if the statement spans multiple lines, this can be really confusing. So you, you wind up having to pop open the test code to actually figure out what's going on. Um, so to help you with that, um, we grab the whole statement, like all of the lines included in the statement that failed. Um, next, uh, we pull out any uh, public local variables that are defined in your test at the time it failed. Um, and so uh, this is really helpful because when I'm looking at when I'm looking at the source and I see this earliest birth date, I'm like, okay, well, what what is that? Like, what is the value of that earliest birth date? And so this local section is really helpful because it helps you recover the state of the world at the time that your test failed without, you know, opening the test code and putting like print or debugging statements everywhere and like rerunning the tests. And then finally. Um, we make it possible for test authors to annotate their tests. Um, and this is like a free form text annotation. Um, and this annotation can include like whatever you as the test author want it to include. Um, it could include like a set of actions to take when this test fails. It could include a link to like a run book that, that has those um, steps to take. Um, but where this annotation really shines is to give some background and additional context on um, why this test is here and why it matters and what you're supposed to do. So information about the test author's intent that really doesn't fit into the test method name or like doesn't fit clearly into the assertion. And so this is the whole thing um, at the correct opacity. Um, and we compare it to, um, again, our normal, um, our normal unit test failure, which just like has a lot, it's a much lower um, information profile. So as we've just seen out of the box, like Marbles gives you better failure messages, but it also gives you a lot of control over um, what's like actually included in that error message. Um, and so the first is that um, uh, we provide um, a set of really rich, like semantically rich um, assertion methods for things that we commonly want to express about data. So things about betweenness and uniqueness and, um, and files. And, the thing that's cool about this is like when you pull out the source code like that and you're presenting the assertion to the test consumer, um, it becomes worthwhile to be really explicit and really clear about what your assumption is. And this is closer to plain English um, than uh, the, just like the bare assert keyword or like assert true. Um, you can also uh, write your own assertion methods. Um, so you can look at you can look at the source code behind the assertions that we wrote to see how we do this. Um, if you write something like let's say you make a bunch of assertions about colors or about temperatures that you think like the rest of the um, the data community might find useful, we would really love to see a pull request from you. Um, um, and the thing that's um, the really cool thing that you can do with this um, sort of inside your organization is you can develop a set of like a set of assertions that are specific to your business that um, are now you can make sure are being asserted in exactly the same way across all of your data teams. Um, you can also uh, control which 
variables um, show up in that local section really easily just by making them public or private. So you can, you as the test author can start to curate, okay, like what information, what locals do I think are gonna be helpful for my test consumer? And, um, sorry, uh, those, um, those node annotations are um, format strings. So you can make references to local variables in your test and they'll be expanded um, when your test fails. So this lets you write really um, detailed, really specific advice that's based on um, the state of the world when your test fails. Um, they're similar to f-strings in Python 3.6 in that um, you don't have to call the format method yourself, but they differ in that these annotations will only be expanded if and when your test fails. So how does this help us when we're testing data? So showing the source um, helps sort of jog your memory and helps you recognize and remember a test. Like when you're looking at a traceback, there's nothing really personal or um, there's nothing really to hold on to in a traceback. But like when I show you the source, you're like, oh, like that is obviously a line of code. Like that's maybe even a line of code that I wrote and that I now remember writing. And the, these like rich, like these semantically rich assertion methods make it a lot clearer about, okay, what is actually the predicate like being tested in this test? Um, I very much prefer the assertion methods that are available in, in, um, in unit test to pi tests just using the assert keyword. Um, they're a lot more expressive and it makes the, um, it makes the failures just like that much easier to sort of um, uh, reverse engineer. Again, the locals help us really quickly um, recover the state of the world. The reason this is especially important when you're writing unit tests for data is that, again, um, the data that you're testing uh, could have been changed by an upstream process that's totally opaque to you. So you might have no idea what these data values are. So showing them um, in the failure um, is especially helpful. And again, um, we can get access to these without putting print or debugging statements all over our code. And finally, the notes uh, communicate the author's sort of intent and knowledge um, when and where you need it most, which is when your test fails. And this information stays up to date because it's like embedded right in the test. And so really what we did is, is Marbles takes a traditional unit test and it treats that failure message as documentation. So that, and we're hope, our hope is that when you start to think about test failures as documentation for test consumers, we'll write clearer and more explicit tests, um, which are gonna help us test more things uh, like data. Uh, it turns out that these failure messages are also really great for just traditional software unit tests. So marbles will work um, perfectly with any unit test tests you have um, today, so you can get these rich messages out of your um, existing unit test without changing any code. Um, in two steps, just pip install marbles and then run your existing unit tests and you'll see um, the marbles failure messages. Um, so uh, again, it's a completely free and open source tool. Um, please visit, visit us on GitHub. You can look at the source code. Um, also take a look at the mixins and, and start thinking about some of your own that you might want to use. Um, and also the uh, the docs are on, on read the docs. Um, that will get into more about how to really take advantage and take advantage of the failure messages and the cool things that you can do with it to really um, help the test consumer out. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. That was very interesting. Any questions? Thanks, I like uh, this tool, but I found something interesting. Uh, in your assertion method, the, the function naming is in, in not in a Python way. It's, yeah. it's like... So this is a unit test, this is a unit test thing. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating and we had, uh, it, made, it was very upsetting. Um, <laughs> so in unit test, um, the assertion methods are camel cased as opposed to snake cased. And um, I don't have, I have an idea about why I think they did this. Um, so that's so that's a, like a unit, like a like a Python unit test decision. In our mixins, we decided to be consistent with that. We had a long debate about it. Um, 
I th I don't know why exactly. If someone here does, um, like, please. My, can I tell you what I think the answer is? <laughs> okay, so th I think the 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 uh, one of the things that it does is it helps you distinguish between um, the assertion method, like distinguish the assert method from other methods on the test case. But <laughs> okay, all right, it's copied from JUnit. <laughs> Okay. That's not a good enough reason. <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, except the uh, assertion, do you consider you know importing like uh, warning? Uh, I don't know, like uh, warning level uh, severity, like uh, oh, it's not. I oh, I see. I see. Um, so I think I understand your question. Um, it's like, uh, do we distinguish between like critical and non-critical failures? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, so we've thought about this a lot, and we and we haven't. Um, but what you can do is that there's um, it's possible in unit tests to write what's called um, a subtest routine, and so um, like inside a single test method, multiple um, assertions uh, will be made, um, and it won't just fail on the first one that fails, but it will go through and and assert them all. Okay. And so what you can do is you can say, okay, here are my severity levels, and you can adjust that note annotation. And then you can sort of, going from like the most severe to least severe, or least severe to most severe, um, sort of make uh, your assertions. And depending on how severe the failure is, that and it, you can change that annotation. Oh, so okay. it could say like, oh my god, this is really bad, in all caps. Or it could be like, eh, wait a week. Okay, thanks, it's nice. Um, yeah, so how, when do you decide when to run this? So like yeah. when, I'm, when I'm making changes in testing code, I just write a unit test and then I write some code, I see things fail and then I correct it. But in this case, I might get new data overnight, I might not get new data overnight. How do you decide when to do this? Yeah, um, so you can write a test to make sure that you got data overnight. Um, but <laughs> Um, so this, so this is um, this is this is challenging. What we've done is um, it depends on the kind of it, it depends on the situation that you're in. Um, it depends on how soon you need to know about failures. Um, you could run, you could you know set up your test suite to run. It could run every day. It could run every hour. Um, you could put it in something like um, an Airflow DAG. So when your sort of airflow DAG senses that data have been delivered to like your S3 bucket or something, it will then kick off the, um, your tests. Another place that you run, um, another place that you might consider writing and running um, unit tests of data like this is um, in your ETL development like process. So if you're writing code that's like manipulating data um, and let's say you're doing like, you're doing some refactoring on an ETL and you wanna make sure that you know, you haven't screwed up the data in any way. Um, it's a useful complement to unit tests of like the software itself. So that's another place that you might consider. But like, without knowing more about the, the uh, like how data are arriving to you, it's hard for me to recommend, make a recommendation about like when to schedule the thing to run. Uh, yeah, sure. So one, one other question that arises to me is like, most of the data that I deal with is temporal in nature. Mm -hmm. And so how do Same. you parameterize this to deal with like different times? So like it failed yesterday, but I don't want it to fail for all time because I can't go back in time and correct the data maybe. Um, um, yeah, so if you are going back in time and correcting the data, it's useful to like run it again and have the failure clear itself. One of the things that I didn't talk about is that um, we also implemented um, assertion logging so every time an assertion is made, um, if you configure the log logger, marbles will dump like a JSON blob with a lot of information about that assertion. And so you can, you can use that information, you can you know, push it to somewhere like Elasticsearch or you know, wherever you wanna put it, to, and you can use it to say, okay, if I see this exact same failure again tomorrow, just like don't bother me, um, is something that you could do. So you don't catalog and store the failures relative to like some particular time period. You just like the failures happen, and then you decide whether you want to deal with it and then move on. Well, so we um, so uh, we work with data sets that are on a lot of different time scales. So it's really data set specific what we decide to do. I know that's a really crappy answer. 
too. <laughs> Just curious how it will work in a stream processing scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jane. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, there's recently been a lot of talk about fairness in algorithmic decision making and how we need to be aware of biases in our data. So I was wondering if something, if you had used something like this to maybe discover uh, some biases in your data sets that you weren't aware of. Or um, if you can even write a unit test to discover a bias. Well, so again, the thing about a unit test is that there, there, there needs to be kind of an unambiguous distinction between failure and success. Um, and what, what we found, you know, I've written many, 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 many tests for data using marbles. And um, I've found ways of sort of taking these more vague, um, like less clear-cut assumptions that I have about data and sort of translating them down into a binary pass-fail. Um, the thing that's hard about that is that you lose some information about what my original like assumption was. But I think for the kind of, for the kind of scenario that you're talking about, that really comes out more in like the data exploration and analysis and like onboarding phase, I think, and not something you would, you know, sort of like, oh, like we've been getting this test for, you know, months and months and months and months and months, and now we think it's biased. I can't really, I would have to think a lot harder about how I might, how I might use this to catch that sort of thing. Yes, one last question for the day. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> um, I'm kind of working in a similar environment, not as big. But we have like a, a huge dashboard, like with green and red dots. <laughs> but that, that stops functioning, I guess, if you have thousands of data sets. Well, how do you do, guys, how, how do you guys do that? So how do we keep track of all these failures? Um, uh, I unfortunately cannot answer this particular question in a lot of detail, um, but we do take um, we do take uh, data stewardship like very seriously. So there, we just we do not um, want to be in a situation where we have data sets that no one sort of understands deeply and like knows about. Um, in terms of presentation, it's just you got to work with your UX people about how to how to consumably, how to, how to sort of present that information in a consumable way. Um, that, in a way that doesn't like scare people too much, scares them the right amount. You want just like the right amount of red. I will say like if your dashboard is entirely green, like you're not ingesting any data. <laughs> that never happens. You got a bigger problem. <laughs> and, uh so you need also, if you find errors, you need a whole catalog of who to call back and what to do. Like, mm -hmm. we have a lot of problems. We don't want to bother the developers anymore with common crashes. So we have this whole process now of, of people, like, monitoring it and then sending follow-up emails and, mm -hmm. hey, guys, your data's fucked up <laughs> again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what you could say is, like, hey, like, you should, like, we need you to put, we keep emailing you about this. We need you to be catching this and, and responding to it yourselves. Like, and here, and if it's the kind of situation where they, where you, where they're not remembering what to do, um, uh, the, like, they're not catching it and they also, like, keep forgetting what they're supposed to do, um, this is actually, this is, like, a really good tool for that because you can be like, look, I'm going to tell you this once, throw it in that annotation, and then whoever's on your team is going to see that. And then you can put your email at the end of it and be like, okay, if worse comes to worse, you can email me and I'll tell you what to do. Um, but yeah, you can, you can use it, um, uh, you can use it to solve a lot of these kind of like tricky organizational conflicts. Because um, you, you don't have any excuses anymore. People run out of excuses. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>